Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. So in week five, we're discussing chromatography. We're going to be getting to gas chromatography pretty soon. But in this lecture, I'm reinforcing and sort of integrating some of the ideas about peak broadening with the Van Diemter equation, which we just learned about. And we're going to be looking at how do we optimize separations given that information. To remind everybody where we last left the soap opera of molecules moving through chromatography columns, we discovered that there was one term in this equation for plate height which said go really, really fast. Because if you go really, really fast through a column, you won't have a lot of mobile phase diffusion and your peaks will be narrow. And then we have another term in the equation that says, hey, if you want your peaks to be narrow, you need to leave a lot of time to equilibrate between the column and the stationary phase so one doesn't get ahead of the other and cause broadening. Well, we got one saying go fast and one saying go slow. So that's what we're going to resolve today. So just remind everybody, term A is kind of the term that doesn't depend on flow rate. It's the just base term that says if you do an injection and you do a detection and you have a packed bed column, there's a certain minimum plate height that you're going to be able to achieve. And remember that low plate height means narrow peaks and good resolution. So we want H to be a tiny number. So we want A to be a tiny number. Then, then we had term B, which was basically mobile phase diffusion. And what that is saying is that in, as a function of time, things diffuse. And what we're going to want to do is get the peak through the column as fast as we can so that diffusion is minimized. And finally, term C was kind of the new term. I call it the mass transfer term, which says that you need to allow for good equilibration between the mobile and the stationary phase. And if you do that, you're going to be able to get much, much narrower peaks. But to do that, you have to go slow. So we sort of have these two contradictory. So we want a small plate height or efficient separation. So what we want is we want H to be tiny. So one of the things you do when you optimize the separation is you actually mess around with your flow rate. You try it fast, you try it slow, and you watch what happens to your peak heights. So for example, in this curve, if I double my flow rate and my peaks get broader, that tells me where I am on this curve. It means that I'm over here where I'm probably limited by mass transfer diffusion. And so if I want to do better, I should back off that flow rate. But don't back off too much because maybe then I would end up going so slow that I would have broadening dominated by mobile phase diffusion. So taking data as a function of flow rate is one of the most common things you do when you're developing a separation, particularly one that you really, really need high resolution on. And what you're trying to do is figure out, can I run it really fast or do I have to run it really slow? So let's go through some practice questions. And again, try to stop the video. You're going to want to go back to this graph to think through some of the answers. OK, so in this first one, you've doubled your flow rate, and you double it again, and your peak widths keep getting broader and broader and broader. So if the peak widths get broader, H is getting bigger. So that tells me that we are in this part of the curve. So we're doubling our flow rates, and our peaks are getting broader. In this particular instance, we are limited by mass transfer. So the reason our peaks are broad is we're not giving the system enough time to equilibrate and allow the mobile phase and stationary phase concentrations to fully equilibrate in the column. So that would be a mass transfer problem. OK, let's look at the next one. Now we're increasing our flow rates and our widths are getting narrower. What does that mean? Well, if we go back to this graph, well, we're clearly not here because we're increasing flow rates and they're getting narrower, so that's a good thing. That must mean we're in this part of the Van Diemter equation. So we are limited by mobile phase diffusion. And by going a little bit faster, we're narrowing up our peaks because not so much diffusion is happening. OK, the last question is kind of a tricky one. I'll let you take a look at it. But it's a good example of actually moving all the way through the Van Diemter equation. You increase your flow rate, things get better, and you increase it some more and they get worse. So the question is, if you go back to about where they got better, what's going on? It's kind of a tough question to answer exactly, but you're in somewhere near the minimum of the Van Diemter, right around 2 mils per minute in this case. And you don't know exactly if you're at the minimum, but it means that you're probably going to be starting to be dominated by the sampling volume and the multiple path issues that are present in the system. And you could maybe tweak it a little bit, but that 2 mils per minute is a really good range to start to explore more detail to see if you can really get to that bottom minimum H or plate height or narrow peaks that you see in the Van Diemter. So in this last example, 
we're operating right in this region. We just don't know exactly where we are. Now, flow rate is only one of the knobs that we have to play with. And there are many other knobs that, that contribute to broadening. And they all came from those equations that I provided in the last mini lecture. And I list some of them here along with their units. You're not going to have to do specific quantitative calculations, but you need to qualitatively understand how they relate to plate height. So the linear flow rate, we've already talked about a lot. That was the subject of the last set of questions. So there's two diffusion constants that matter, the diffusion in the mobile phase and the diffusion in the stationary phase. And each have an impact on different terms in Van Diemter. What's interesting is if you increase the temperature, it's going to help term three, but it's going to hurt term two. So the B term is going to get worse with temperature, but the C term is going to get better with temperature. So again, temperature is a funny variable. It's kind of like flow rate, unless you know what's the source of your broadening, you don't really have a lot of guidance on whether you want to cool your column down or heat it up. K is a moderate effect. Generally speaking, it's how much time you spend in the column, but we won't go into that in a lot of detail. The diameter of the packing particles and the thickness of the stationary phase both play into the equilibration that it takes. And so when those two things are tiny, you get rapid equilibration, and that mass transfer term is much less significant. By the way, retention factor is the same as capacity factor or little k. So let's do some other practice equations that really test how you can connect your understanding of plate height and making narrow peaks to some of those other terms. So if you're running your separation very, very slow in order to be at the minimum of that curve, so you don't, can't go fast because you run into mass transfer, so you go slower and slower and slower until it's taking like an hour to do your separation, um, what do you do? What could you change that would let you run faster but not broaden your peaks, because you'd always go to better flow rates, but then you might hit mass transfer issues. Well, what you want to do probably is make your stationary phase thinner. What that's going to allow you to do is go a little bit faster without paying the price of the mass transfer. I think temperature could be a reasonable answer too, but without knowing really what the dominant issues are and how much your temperature is going to go up, it's a little bit of a tricky answer to give. Let's say you increase your column temperature in HPLC and you see a notable increase in your peak widths. What does that tell you? Well, remember, what that's telling you is that one of those terms is dominant. One of them is making, really accounting for a lot of the broadening observed in HPLC. So when you increase temperature, you're going to be increasing your mobile phase diffusion. And that's going to actually make your peak widths worse. But if you increase temperature, you're actually going to be helping diffusion into the stationary phase, which is going to make that term better. So temperature pushes those two terms in different ways. So the fact is, when you increase the temperature, you made the peaks worse, tells me that in this case, it's actually the mobile phase diffusion that's dominating your peak widths. Finally, um, you are splurging. We're going to talk more about capillary columns in a second, but it's an open tube column, so there's no packing material in the middle. So right away, term A is going to be really good because there's actually no multiple paths. It's kind of straight shot down the middle. Um, but what feature of this open tube column is going to have the biggest impact on the plate height? That's kind of a strange question because depending on the dimensions, any of them might. But if you reason it through, the single most important factor then is actually going to be the column length because the longer you go, the better the resolution. But really, for our discussions, it's the thickness of the stationary phase. So when you buy these columns, you can actually spec out what the thickness is. And if you go really, really thin in that plate, in that stationary phase thickness, you'll have very rapid equilibration, and you can run fast without paying the price in peak widths due to mass transfer. So I hope that you sort of followed some of those logical arguments that uh, help you kind of reason through what do you have to do to make H really tiny. I'm going to go ahead and post, and it's, it's really going to just be for some extra credit work, an Excel sheet that I've used to sort of type up the Van Diemter equation. I'm going to go to it real quick and just show you what it does. So in this Excel sheet, you can kind of play around with some numbers. So let's make a hypothesis. If we make the stationary phase thinner, well, we can see here that we have a really, really steep cost as we go faster. Boy, we're losing a lot of our plate height. So if we make this thin, let's go to point one, that should get better. And sure enough, it did. So what this is really good for is predicting some hypotheses about how this graph should change as a function of things like the thickness of the stationary phase. If we change stationary phase diffusion, let's say we made it a bigger number. How about 1 times 10 to the minus 8? 
Well, look what we did there. We made it even better. So it gives you a sense of sort of playing around with these and looking at how it changes the equation. And I think I would recommend that you sort of write down what you think is going to happen. You try it out and you see if it does. Okay, so that's where we're going to leave the Van Diemter equation. It's going to be a really important set of concepts as we go through both gas chromatography and liquid chromatography and method design, because a lot of what you're doing in method design is sort of playing off these various factors that lead to broad peaks if you go too fast or too slow. And you might be altering temperature or the size of the column or certain geometric factors also to minimize plate height.